for making the time. Um, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight for the April um, meeting of the social media, uh, Area UK Social Media Forum. Um, tonight we here we have here with us Dr. Evelyn Okapanachi. Is that pronounced right? Okapanachi. <laughs> um, and she's the former editor in chief of Rich um, Women Africa magazine. Um, and she's worked a lot in uh, media and uh, women empowerment. And um, she's also the co-founder of RAPS. It's uh, an organization um, to eradicate poverty and starvation in Africa. Um, she also works in education campaign, agricultural campaign and food campaign, all things very vital to um, a developing continent like Africa. Um, she's also partnered with Nigeria's Security and Civil Defense Corps to deliver a successful workshop on PCVE, uh, and that was held in Abuja in um, April 2019. So very extensive CV. <laughs> um, so let's just start with you telling us a little bit about um, what drew you to women empowerment and how did you find yourself working in this kind of area? I think women empowerment has been around for years, as most of you would know. Um, I'm actually quite inspired, as I mentioned earlier to yourself, about even the Eritrean women. So in 1979, you've set up your um, National Eritrean Women's Society, which I think is so commendable. So yes, women empowerment is now a coined word, it's a hashtag, right? But you've been doing it since 1979, which I believe is very commendable. So we have been there, we have been out fighting as women, um, most particularly in Africa, because we've had to. And um, for me, it's always been a drive. So I have two daughters. I have always um, believed that women, we need to show what value we add to society. I think sometimes that's forgotten um, who we are. And sometimes what was seen as women would be in the kitchen and very domesticated and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that first of all but there was also more that we had to offer and there was also more that we can add to build our communities and our, uh, our continents so for myself it was um, I worked with many women um, in many um, organizations and institutions and Many times you ha used to hear this excuse, well, I don't have enough money, or I'm single, or I'm, you know, or I'm married, funny enough. So you'd hear the singles complaining and saying, actually, I can't progress because I'm single. And you'd hear the married ones saying, well, I can't progress further because I'm married. So what I was hearing quite a lot was a lot of excuses of why we cannot continue to support and to build. And I've always had the notion, um, my father brought me up that way, to believe that women can do every anything. You can build a family and a successful home, as well as also be a leader. And so that was probably where my drive came from, which is women empowerment. And actually, let's empower, let's take away the limiting factors and not believing that we are worthy um, enough to be in the same room or around the same table as powerful leaders. So, and I do believe that actually women are the pillar of society. So there is a rise. There is so much more that women can do. There are conversations that women can have that men may not be able to have. And I think it's really important that I think men and women are a team. So when people hear feminism and they hear women empowerment, they actually believe that the emancipation of women means a decrease of men. And I actually oppose that because that's not true. I do believe that what we're doing as women is we're adding value. We're actually your companions, we're your helpmates. We are builders of society. So it doesn't by any way mean that we demean the male um, figure in society. And again, which is a very powerful, um, a very powerful figure, but that also means that the men shouldn't be doing it alone. Let's help. That's what we're here for. And that's my notion of women empowerment. And as I mentioned earlier, I have two, two daughters and I want them to be able to add value. I want them to contribute to society um, by lifting others up and lifting up their, when we say our comrades, but that's also our male counterparts. None of us will be here without a male or a female. So that means that we're needed together and not in isolation. So yeah, that's my journey on women empowerment and why I do believe that it's really uh, powerful that we um, bring women into the conversations and that we also empower ourselves to do better. 
That's very interesting, and it is a very important topic. Like you said, the female population is half of the uh, society's population, and they can't be a successful or flourishing society without um, a woman's input. Um, so tell us a little bit about the education and food campaign that you're doing in Nigeria, and how does that tie in with um, the the women emancipation work that you're you're doing? Yeah, sure. So that's actually through um, our organisation called REAPS, which is Royal Initiative Against Poverty and Starvation. And why did we look at education and agricultural campaign? There's a reason for that. It's because when we look at the emancipation of the economy, there are two key drivers here. Well, actually three. So one is leadership. So you need effective leadership for any country or continent to be f truly free. And then you need education and Agriculture. Agriculture is so powerful and I don't think people realise how powerful agriculture is. And that's because it's the food. So we're talking about food, we're talking about the food technology and what drives. So what's quite interesting at the moment is, um, I would say quite interesting but also quite sad, is that Africa imports a lot of their food. Why? It's, it's a question I've had to ask myself so many times that it's actually quite painful when you actually know what we have, what our soil gives us. It's nothing compared to what other soils give. We are very rich in Africa, and therefore, why are we? Should we not be exporters as opposed to importers? And so I think that's a key driver. And sometimes this is really down to the education. It's down to the technology. So we need to educate to understand, okay, fine, what type of fertilizers do we need to use? How do we preserve? How do we export? Look at the food chain. And we need to look at that type of product cycle. And how do we market? That's the key. And with that, we need education. So we know that there's a lot of farms in Africa. There's a lot of farmland. But we're using it and we're consuming, but we're not exporting. So we're not making the money and we're not raising our economy by that. However, we're importing rice, we're importing coffee. And I know Eritrea actually has, you know, coffee. You have a lot of coffee there. That's your raw um, ingredient. So it's quite interesting that we're going to other countries and actually importing what we should actually be exporting. That's exactly the same for if I talk about Nigeria and the oil. It's the same thing. How can we be importing when we're actually you know, we can actually be exporting that type of oil. And we are exporting, but not as we should be. So we're actually buying in oil, exporting a small amount because we haven't got the technology to refine it. And then we're importing oil. So again, it takes education. And I do believe education is very, very powerful, but education without the tools actually means nothing. So hence the reason why one of our campaigns was to look at educating, yes, right down from childhood, but also looking at how then do we translate that? How do, do we make that more practical? And um, it's been quite interesting because when I talk to some African children and I look at the level of maths they're doing and I compare that to our European counterparts, ourselves, we're here in the Western world, and it's absolutely not even on the same level. I probably couldn't have done the same maths that they were doing in Africa at that age. And so that astounded me, and I realised that actually they're very intelli intelligent, and, but where is it applied? How do we translate that and apply that? And that's what we need to be able to do. We need to be able to educate that we can compete on an international level playing field. And I think that's missed quite a bit. So that was the purpose of an education campaign. Agriculture is to understand, first of all, we have the resources. It's there. We have, sorry, the material, the raw material. We have the food, we have the farms. What are we doing with it? Why are we bringing in? So we have to understand the value of what we have. I think that was really quite key. So that's the reason why those two campaigns were actually one of our first, first two. And then we needed to look at the model of education. So what's the difference with the education in the Western world and in, in the developing countries? So let's use the word that, that um, internationally they like to use, which is developing. Um, we're not developing, we are developed, we're just not maximising what we have and we're not actually showcasing the world what we have. So, and that goes back down to the education framework. So one of our education campaigns is we took the consultants, um, education consultants over to Nigeria 
um, in 2019 and they looked at our structure and looked at how, and they were actually quite astounded as well in terms of the level and what the children actually knew was even far more, more but it's application. So what we need to be able to do is leverage on that education. So again, so we can enter into those international arenas. So education, as we know, is power. You know, without knowledge. Brilliant. <laughs> no, absolutely. And um, you touched on very important points in terms of uh, the imports of food and um, how much we're importing in terms of uh, in comparison to how much we're exporting, um, especially now after COVID, uh, the pandemic has slowed down a lot of imports and we've seen extensive uh, price rises. And even now with the Russian Ukraine situation, it's halted a lot of the, the wheat imports that uh, is mostly imported to Africa. Um, so how do you see this African uh, continental free trade uh, area mitigating this? And w what could we do to have more women empowered enough to play a role in this, to make it more successful and in turn for them to be more empowered? That's a really good question. So yes, post, well, are we post COVID, but we are transitioning out of COVID. Now that's quite interesting because in Africa, we have 13% of women that own farms so that's probably the answer to your first question, which is we need to increase and scale up the amount of women owned farms. So, and why do I say women? It's because what it's about economies of scale. So once you scale up and you are, and as I talked about being that helper, so being that collaborative partner, we need to be able to work together and look at, okay, fine, Eritrea has this, but Ethiopia doesn't have this. How can we exchange? So, and this is what they did before currency came in. So again, an exchange is just currency. And so we do need to look at that in terms of within the continent, what can we do? What can we share amongst ourselves? Of course, at lower cost than we would if we were exp exporting outside the continent. And I think that's quite key to look at, first of all, that value. What do we have? Why? And then the question is, why do we value more exports than, in, than what we have? So that's something that we need to look at ourselves. So there's almost a paradigm shift, which is, OK, so why are we not probably enjoying the porridge that is made in Africa? And why are we enjoying the ones that are made in um, outside Africa? Is it because we think they are more superior? So these are the things that we also have to question ourselves. Why are we not shall I say, um, enjoying our own. It's enjoying our own substance. Why are we not doing that? Why are we not endorsing? Why are we not supporting ourselves? And I think this is where we need to look at our continent as a whole, which is, are we as supportive of one another? So are we, am I buying from your farm? Are you buying from my farm? And we, it's almost breaking a poverty mindset. So what we do have in our continent is we tend to, think, well, this is my area and I'll look after my area and this is only enough for me. Whereas actually we have to look at ourselves as abundant. Africa is abundant. We have unlimited resources. So why are we not tapping into those resources? So again, sometimes it's down to leadership, it's down to our mindsets, it's down to shifting away from what is, it's almost a cultural shift, which is actually, let's share, let's work together. Because as Africa is one, we're actually very powerful. And if you look at what we hold, our gold, our iron, our tin, our farmlands, if we compare that to the Western world, we actually are in the majority. So how do we, how do we move forward? We work together. We work together without greed. We work together, collaboration, supporting, and seeing actually doing that, we actually increase our economies of scale. Absolutely. Um, and just to take you back again to the food and agriculture, because that is, I think, the staple of moving forward and developing um, Africa as a continent, and especially starting from the nuclear family all the way up to the society and the economy. Um, now, with climate change, there's a lot of talks going on. Um, we recently had COP26, which wasn't as um, successful as it mm. should have been. And a lot of developing countries have said that they're being left behind. How do you think this will impact women in Africa? Well, to be fair, on an international point of view, we are left behind quite a lot. 
but we know this and that's the reason why we have um so the un launched um sdg um five which is um so sdg is sustainable development goals and that was to gender equality and empowerment of women so the question here is are we maximizing the initiatives that are out there so we have to also look at the opportunities so you're you're right in the sense that okay fine women you know we are tend to be left behind but also we do need to seek the opportunities that are there because they are there <laughs> sometimes they're a little bit hidden and i think i can't remember who made the quote that you know the best way to hide information is put it in a book so i won't go I, i'm paraphrasing because i know ex the exact quote that was made but my point there is their information is there so if you were to go onto the un you would see there is a lot of initiatives of women, on women empowerment, gender equality. And we had a previous discussion where we spoke about gender equality or gender equity is my question. So um, when we look at, we want to be equal, do we really want to be equal? Do we really want to do what men do in their entirety without having to sacrifice things? So we do, we do need to understand in the first instance and we do need to get involved and there's participation. And that's the reason why sometimes we said how many women are around the t tables how many women are in the corridors of power but that takes sacrifice and that's where i ask the question which is is it gender equality or gender equity that we're actually looking at, looking for but participation is key to ha have your voice so if you don't participate who's going to hear you if you're not involved who's going to hear you who will take us seriously if we're not involved with what is close to us, whether it's MMR, whether it's maternal mortality ratios that we're quite disappointed in, whether it's the education system, if we do not sit around the tables, and I'll give you an example, um, so for example, I'm a governor um, for education as well, and we struggled, and we still struggle for years to get governors in. And that's because many people don't want to sacrifice their time. And, but yet, we'll sit on the other side and we'll complain, that things are broken, it's not working, but yet we don't want to sacrifice. And it takes sacrifice. So there are some men that are in positions that women might say, actually, that's not fair, I'd like to be there. But are you willing to sacrifice and give up what they have to give up to be able to be around that table? So I, I would say get involved. The key thing is to get involved. Start somewhere. Get involved. Be around the right tables. Talk to your colleagues and understand what the pressure points are and how we can support. Because I think with women, we're very good at complaining and that's fine, <laughs> you know, that's part of our makeup. But are we good at acting as well? And I, and I you know, as I said, I, I go back to commending the Eritrean women because, you know, definitely through Segreda and others that I've learned how when there was time to fight, the Eritrean women went side by side the men, which again is very commendable. Um, you do not see that in many African countries. But then at least you're you're willing to, you were willing to do that. Therefore, you would also be willing to have a seat at the table. So so it's a little bit different when you don't want to get involved but complain. Um, but we really do need to act, not just speak. We need to act and and step forward. Yeah, I think that's a very important point that you've brought up about the Eritrean um, freedom fighters. And I think because they led by example, yes. they've earned the, the seat Absolutely. at the table and no man can take that away from them because it's something that they had to prove yeah. uh, on the ground. So once again, on behalf of the audience, I would like to thank you for being here with us today. And we really appreciate your time and effort. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.